Now we're ready to continue building a package by adding a variable where we can store the query results so that it can be used elsewhere in our package. We'll go in and edit the execute SQL task. And we'll change the result set property here and configure this to take a full result set. So we can, if we knew that we had only a single row being returned by the execute SQL task, we could select that option or we could um, store XML as a result set option here. But we're going to use uh, the full result set here because we're getting 10 records with our current query configuration and two columns. It is possible for your query to return multiple result sets. And so this setting here determines what is the format or the structure of that result set. Then we're going to go to the result set page in the editor and we're going to assign the results to a variable. So we're going to add and what we're going to do here is we're going to map the results to a variable. Now the way that you do this will depend on the type of result set that you had. Remember from the previous page that one of the options for a result set type was a single row. So in that case you could take the result name, here we just have the default of new result name, but you could take the column name or the number of the column that in its position of the column list and put that in the result name column here and then map that to a specific variable. In our case we're using a full result set and so when you're using a full result set or if you're using XML as the result set type you need to use the value of zero. There's no other option possible here. Then for variable name we don't have any variables currently defined so we will add a new variable on the fly here and the add variable dialog box opens up and we can see that the scope is associated with a container. In this case we can see that the email customers is the container that would be the package. If we expand the executables folder we would see our execute SQL task, the retrieve customer emails. And if we selected that scope then our variable would only be available within the context of the execute SQL task. Which wouldn't do us any good for the purposes of this package because our, our goal is to share the variable to a downstream task. So in that situation we do need to have the email customers selected. So the scope of the package or the scope of the variable would be the package itself. Remember from our lecture that the uh, other options for scope would be containers. So if I had um, containers added to this package, we would see those listed here as an option as well. So it would be possible to assign a variable that's used from one task to another within a given container, but um, not anywhere else in that particular package. In our case, usually the recommendation is to leave things at the package scope and you'll stay out of trouble. Next we have the name of the variable. So we'll change the default to customers. And notice that it's defaulting to the user namespace. There are by default two different namespaces that you have available within a package one would be system and the other would be user. You can create your own namespaces but generally user is sufficient here. And the value type because we're using a result set with multiple rows we need to change this to an object value type. And we don't need to initialize the value. We, we aren't going to make any changes. We could make this read only but we'll just leave this as is. So now we have a variable added to our package and we're assigning that variable with the value returned by the 10 records from our result from our query execution. So we're done ec editing the execute SQL task. Our next step is to add a container. So we're going to as part of our package iterate through each record returned by that re result set. So the best option for us to do that iteration is to use the for each loop container. So we'll add that. 
Now we want this for each loop container to execute only after we've executed the SQL task. So we can create a precedence constraint to control that processing sequence. When I click on a task, then a little green arrow appears below that I can connect to something else. So notice when I click on the for each loop container, a green arrow appears there. So we can always connect by using this precedence constraint, clicking on a task and then dragging the green arrow and connecting it to the next task in sequence. The green means that it's only going to execute the container if retrieve customer emails completes successfully. You can change that behavior to a different type of precedent constraint by right clicking that arrow and you could choose failure or completion so that would be the simple edit process but you could also change it to a more complex type of precedence constraint by opening the edit editor here and so we can change the evaluation operation right now which is set to constraint only we could change it so that uh, it will depend upon an expression or we can base it on an expression and a constraint or the expression or constraint so we have a lot of flexibility here we'll be setting up uh, an expression later in this demonstration so right now a constraint with success only is perfect for our, our needs our next step is to configure the container. So we'll right click on the container title and select edit. And we'll give this a name. We'll call this deliver emails. So the process will be to read each record in the result set and then to send an email to the current record. Whenever you work with a for each loop editor, you need to tell it what is the collection that it's going to be iterating through. So we'll switch to the collection page here. And there are various enumerators that we have available. The default is a file enumerator. So you would use this, for example, if you had several files out on your uh, network that you want to go out and just iterate through each one of those files to do processing. You can also iterate through other types of collections. So you have various types of enumerators and the selection that you make will determine the interface that allows you to configure that particular enumerator. Because we're working with a record set in our variable, we're going to select for each ADO enumerator. And now we're prompted in the configuration section to provide the source variable containing that ADO object. So that would be the variable that we created in the previous um, step of the e execute SQL task. Now that object only contains one table so our selection here of rows in the first table is suitable. Then our next step is to do variable mappings because remember that that object contains two columns one for the email address and one for the customer name so we're going to map those variables or rather map those columns into two new variables. So we can create those here. We'll just select in the drop down list. We'll select new variable. And again we'll use the package as our scope for the container. and we'll name the first one email address and that would be a string variable value type and we'll leave the value blank and we'll use an index of zero that indicates the first column in our result set and we'll add a second variable for the customer name which is also a string and that gets assigned index 1. In other words, column number 2 in our result set will be mapped to the customer name variable. Okay, we're done with this configuration of the for each loop. 
What we've done so far in our package is to find and execute SQL tasks that will retrieve a list of customers and their email addresses, populate a variable, and then we use a for each loop to iterate through each record in that result set and map each column in the result set to two new variables, one for the email address and one for customer name. Then we'll use that information and send it into a sent mail task that I'm going to add into the container. So because this the send mail task is inside the container, it executes each time we hit a new inter iteration of that loop. So let's edit the send mail task and give it a name. We'll call this send email. And then on the mail page, we configure the connection to an SMTP server, which we don't have a connection defined yet, so we can create one on the fly. So I will set up for my server as Miami and then use Windows Authentication and click OK. So that adds another connection manager to the package that can be reused elsewhere in this package anytime I need to connect to an SMTP server. My next step then is to configure the mail message so I can define from. So I'll put in a fake address here from SSIS at AdventureWorks dot com and then my to address will change based on the current iteration so I want to use the email address for each customer but I still have to populate something in this field otherwise I cannot configure the send mail task address so we're going to override this value at runtime but meanwhile I'm going to populate this with a fake address and I'm going to do a blind copy to the administrator, which is how I'm logged in to the server. Next, I can supply a subject that will appear in the email message. So this is a defect notice. And we'll give this a high priority. Now for ultimate uh, flexibility, we use expressions, and expressions override property values at runtime. So remember with the to property, I have that configured right now with customer at adventureworks.com, but what I really want to use is whatever the current email address is as defined by the current record in the iteration of our loop based upon the result set. So expressions allow us to change a property at runtime. So we come into the expressions page and click the ellipsis button and we select the property that we want to override. I'm actually going to override two properties. I'm going to start with the two line property which is the recipient of the message. Then I'll click the ellipsis button here to open up the expression builder. Now the expression builder shows me all of the available variables. I can see the system variables as well as the user variables. I also have the functions that I have available. This is SQL Server Integration Services Expression Language. It looks very much like C, but it is not. And you can explore the various functions that are available, and as you point to, a particular function you can see tooltips that tell you what that function does and you can also see by the layout here what the syntax of that function is. Now in this example I have the email address already established in the variable so all I have to do is take that and I can drag and drop that into my expression box here. And notice how it formatted that variable. It started with an at sign and then put the variable name itself inside of brackets. Now if I had 
a current email address, I could click this Evaluate Expression button down below and see how that string evaluates. But because there is no current value assigned to email address, I just get uh, no value here. But as you're constructing, say, string expressions, it's handy to be able to see the result of that appear below. So we have successfully configured our two line. My next step is to configure the message source property. So this becomes the body of the message. And I want this to be dynamic. So we'll use an expression to build out a more personalized message. So anytime you're working with strings, you want to encase your, your constant values with double quotes. So I'm going to type dear space and then another double quote. And then use the plus sign for concatenation. And then I'm going to grab another variable here for the customer name. Drag that into my string expression builder. And then uh, add another plus sign and then a comma and of course you can add ASCII symbols in here to do new lines but I'm just gonna do it real simple statement here we're sorry your bike is a defect and add in the customer name of course you could add more information about what to do about that information but we're just gonna do a simple demonstration here to show that we can dynamically construct the body of the message and incorporate variables from our package so we'll click OK and that completes configuring our send mail message And we're ready to test our package. And we'll execute this and see what happens. So the yellow indicates a task is in progress. Green, of course, means it completes successfully. And so we have the execute SQL task occurred. And then the for loop container went through all 10 iterations. And we could see the send email task flip to green and then back to yellow as it started a new iteration. And then when all of those uh, iterations were complete, the for each loop container turns green as well. So at this point, we should have 10 email messages generated and sent to our SMTP server. I'm going to go ahead and stop debugging here. And now let's check our directory where the email addresses were sent for the SMTP server. In our test environment here, the inetpub mail root drop folder contains our 10 messages. And we can right click on one of them and select open. And we can actually see the from SSIS at AdventureWorks and then the name of the uh, email address at adventureworks.com, the subject, defect notice, and then the string that was created, Dear Rob Verhoff, we're sorry your bike is a defect. And then each one of these messages, of course, will have a different message for the uh, applicable customer. So very quickly and easily, just with two tasks and a container, we were able to generate email messages that were dynamically constructed based on data that we extracted from our SQL Server database.